For your viewing pleasure, this broadcast of the Municipal Council Meeting of Alpena is made possible by the funding provided by the City of Alpena. Thank you for your generosity. I'll call the order, please. Johnson? Here. Nielsen? Here. Nowak? Here. Sexton? Here. Walagora? Here. Uh, please rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Any modifications to the agenda this evening? One, um, and that's um, the Waterways Grant Request. Don Gilmet suggests uh, that we put that under New Business B. Mm -hmm. So moved. Second. Nielsen? Yes. Nowak? Yes. Sexton? Yep. Paul Gora? Aye. Johnson? Yes. Okay. Any others? Approval of the minutes for regular session of February 20th, 2017 and regular session of February 23rd, 2017. Any issues or changes? Citizens appearing before council on agenda and non-agenda items are allowed five minutes each to address your concerns. If you'd like to do so, please come to the podium and state your name and address for our records. On the consent agenda this evening, uh, A is bills to be allowed in the amount of $217,817.08. B is the approval of the emergency budget amendment for fire department to purchase radios of $50,000. C is the Thunder Bay Film Society Summer Movies by the Bay 2017 variance of noise ordinance from 10 p.m. to 12 a.m. on June 23rd, July 7th and 28th, August 4th and 18th, September 1st, and a request for alternate days of June 30th, August 11th and 25th, and September 8th to be reserved and the band shell rental be waived. D is a one city council reappointment to the city of Alpena Building Authority for a three-year term expiring 3-19-2020 as Karen Hebert. And E is the approval of the 2017 election inspector's wages. May we approve the consent agenda? Second. Nowak? Yes. Sexton? Yes. Walagora? Aye. Johnson? Yes. Nielsen? Yes. Thank you. Any presentations, no announcements. I have a proclamation this evening for Social Host Responsibility Month, April. April 2017 is Social Host Responsibility Month. Underage drinking is, is a national public health issue with serious implications. Although we have done much work and made progress here in Northern Michigan to address this pervasive problem, there is still much more we can do. According to a study by the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, an estimated 10 million people younger than the age of 21 drank alcohol in the past month in the United States. Whereas underage drinking is a problem that affects our community, our health, and our future, it exacts a terrible toll on individuals and family and places a costly burden on the community at large for law enforcement, medical services, and other social services involved in the prevention and treatment of underage drinking. And whereas underage drinking has severe consequences, many of which parents and caregivers may not be fully aware, consequences of underage drinking may include injury or death from accidents, unintended, unwanted, and unprotected sexual activity, academic problems, and drug use. And whereas parents and caregivers have a significant influence on young people's decision about alcohol consumption, especially when they create supportive and nurturing alcohol-free environments. 
And whereas youth who start drinking before the age of 15 are five times more likely to develop, to develop an alcohol dependence or abuse later in life than those who begin drinking at or after age 21. And whereas alcohol by uh, use by young people is dangerous, not only because of the risks associated with acute impairment, but also because of the grave threat to their long-term development and well-being. And whereas parents, educators, community leaders who work with our young people every day are our best advocates for responsible decision making. And whereas 100% of any alcohol consumed by a minor came from an adult, at one time an adult over the age of 21 was in control of the alcohol and a minor gained access to it. And, where it is, is, and whereas it is illegal for adults knowingly to knowingly allow their child's friends to drink alcohol in their home, even with the permission of the friend's parents, and adults have the authority and should have the responsibility to take steps to reduce the likelihood that their homes will become venues for underage drinking. And now therefore, be it resolved by our council members' organization, oh, sorry, by our council members of the city of Alpena, a community committed to underage drinking prevention, do hereby proclaim that April 2017 is Social Host Responsibility Month. We also call upon our parents, citizens, homeowners, and property owners to host gatherings responsibly and take measures to eliminate excess of alcohol to persons under the age of 21. And this evening we have Barb Edison from Up North Prevention with us. Hearings, report of officers tonight are bids. One is uh, for the carbon changeout at the water production plant. <coughs> Excuse me. Rich. Um, the city began using carbon for taste and odor issues back in 1999 at the water production plant. Um, and basically what, what we did is we added, removed some of the filter sand that was in our filter beds and replaced it with a layer of carbon. Carbon has a life expectancy of about three years. So every three years, we, we bid it out. Um, every time we've rebid it, um, I think on only one occasion, there was one other bidder. And but Calgon has been the low bidder or the only bidder on all of our changeouts since 1999. Last time when we changed it out, we opted for a different process. Instead of bringing in virgin carbon, what we did is we took our carbon off our filter beds, we took it back to the plant and reactivate it, basically burn it, gets rid of all the impurities in the carbon and basically it's not virgin carbon but it's as close to it and it is an approved MDEQ method. So at, at the end last year, they basically took three of our filter beds worth of, of granular activated carbon back and stored it at their plant with the intention it would be reactivated and used this time. So. Um, and then about every third time that we do one of these carbon change zones, because when you, when you they basically use a vector truck and, and vector off that carbon layer, they also pull a little bit of the sand out. Um, so about every three, third time, we have to go in and supplement our sand to bring it back up to the, to the DEQ required depth. Um, so we don't have any short circuiting of, of water through that filter media. So this happens to be one of those times. So we did, it's, it's more costly than it has been the last two filter change outs. But this year, the project involves purchasing, delivering, installing, disinfecting, and testing additional sand needed for each filter, as well as they provided two options. One to, um, which required more virgin carbon. The other one was to basically reactivate 
Uh, most of our carbon, they will always have to bring in some virgin carbon to supplement because there is a certain amount that's lost during shipping <laughs> and uh, the activation process. Um, the proposed pricing from Calgon, option one was $259,471.94. Uh, they would use um, our reactivated carbon on the first three filter beds, take that back and reactivate it. And then we would also bring enough virgin carbon to complete the four filter beds that would remain. And then option two, which is a little uh, uh, more cost effective, is where they actually bring back our reactivated carbon and, and reuse that. Uh, in the process. A little bit longer because there is a reactivation process, but our plant isn't down for a whole month at a time. And that, the cost for that is $224,426.91. Um, and then the comments below are actually from Mike uh, Collins, our plant, and that during the exchange, the week-long installations, not the two to three week in between to reactivate for either option. Uh, the wastewater or the water treatment plant will be down to using only five build, five filters, which would limit the production to about 1.7 million gallons per day under the current 12-hour shifts. Uh, they anticipate altering going to eight-hour shifts, basically running, producing water 16 hours a day to meet the demands, uh, which could be 2.3 million gallons. Per day or our average last year was about 2.05. It's my recommendation to city engineer to contract with Calgon Carbon Corporation for the 2017 carbon change out project. Option two, <coughs> give the amount of $224,426.91. This is payable over a three year period with billings twice each year and that's the way they've basically handled it since 1999. They set it up on a payment plan because most water facilities can't take a full hit for uh, for paying for the carbon up front. Uh, funding is established in the water production plant budget under supplies for this ongoing project. Rich, the uh, uh, carbon that we use, how often can they use reactivated carbon? I mean, has it only got a shelf life of changing it out once, a couple of times? I think they, they can reactivate it. They, 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 what they do is they reactivate it and then they run a test on it. And if there's too many impurities done at that point in time, I don't know and I don't know if they know what that is. It just depends on you know, the, the material that that filter is taking out, the taste and odor issues that we're taking out on how many times that can be reactivated. But we have not had a problem uh, the last two times. It actually brought it up to very close to virgin specs. Okay. Also, I was, I was trying to understand, in 2014, I believe that the cost to use the carbon, and I believe it was reactivated, was about 178000 at that time. Mm -hmm. And our option now is uh, 224 426 uh, as the best. And I'm just wondering, is it just because, it, is that all replacement of the sand, or what is causing the additional cost? A big chunk of it. The sand is very costly, because I asked the same question to Mike okay. Collins down at the water plant. And okay. He had been in conversation with Calgon. Basically, the sand, a the sand got more expensive because it has to be a certain type of sand that's used in the filter beds, okay. um, and then the disinfection process that has to take place on it. Okay. And it was, uh, I want to say that this was 2008 when we changed the, uh, the, the put additional sand in before, and. <coughs> Um, we saw about a 20-25% hike from the previous year's price that year as well, which is about what we're seeing this year from last year. Okay. With the same, I think it's a 26% hike on this this one. Okay. Those are my questions as well. So, okay. anyone, anyone else? else? <laughs> <laughs> I move we contract with Calgon Car Carbon Corporation for the carbon changeout projects in the amount of two twenty four, four twenty six, and ninety one cents. Sex. Sexton. Yes. Wallagora. Aye. Johnson. Yes. Nielsen. Yes. Noah. Yes. All right. Rich is up here for number two as well. Downtown two way traffic study. M dot row. Um, 
Fairfield City Council approved the conversion of Second Avenue State Street to Water Street from one way to two way. They also direct staff to investigate the conversion to two way of the MDOT controlled sections in the downtown. These would include Second Avenue from Chisholm to Third Avenue and Third Avenue from Chisholm to Washington Avenue. Um, the analysis for this conversion per MDOT permit would require the use of an MDOT pre-qualified consultant to perform the work. Engineering de staff developed the request for proposals, RFP, and solicited the notice. Uh, the city received proposals from seven firms interested in providing these services to the city. Uh, and I, I apologize, the bid tab was not included with your uh, with a memo, but it, I did provide it to you tonight. And the prices range, and I actually, if you look at the bid tab, uh, the last one, OHM, is 50, 15660. My uh, <coughs> recommendation, I reference it as 16640. If you look at the second page that I handed you on their proposal, there was some lump sum extras. Um, if we were interested in it, I think it was timing, light timing, um, et cetera. Uh, it bumped it up to the 16640. We were just read the, the base bid when we, when we did the bid opening. But basically, prices run from 16640 um, up to $41,000. Um, we went through all the proposals, we looked at them. Um, all of them being pre qualified, um, did meet the, the requirements of MDOT. We as a courtesy, send it over to uh, Gaylord, the, to the uh, Transportation Center in Gaylord, as well as the local TSC for their review. Um, only, only we got back was positive comments on OHL. Um, staff reviewed the proposals based on qualifications, work proposed, past work, similar in nature and cost. Based on this review, city staff selected the firm of OHM advisors as the entity to perform the work. Basically, they said they were going to do everything, same as all the others. Uh, they were low price. The one question, and Greg asked me about it today, was um, you'll see one of them that lists here on engineering uh, along the Fleece and Vanderbrink. Um, typically, you know, if that were the case, we would. We would have the opportunity to invoke the, the local business process. But when you look at strictly the pre qualified firms, um, Fleece and Vanderbrink is the pre qualified firm that would be the lead. The only thing in Huron Engineering was just doing some, some minor data collection for them. Um, so we, that's why we elected to just stay with a little bit of uh, OHM. It is my recommendation as city engineer to award the <coughs> downtown traffic study contract to OHM advisors in the amount of $16,640. Uh, the cost to perform this evaluation would be shared equally between the city and the DDA. And I, I have been in contact with OHM. Matter of fact, I got an email late this afternoon as far as putting together a timeline. And I said, let's just wait till tomorrow and make sure we're, we're all on board and then we'll, we'll be putting together on the timeline. So. This is strictly going to be looking at Second Avenue, the, the one-way sections of M32 um, for this study. The only question to, that Greg answered earlier that um, was because the DDA was paying half if there was a communication between when the bids came in with them, apparently there was, and the DDA has no issues with with the <coughs> suggestion as well. I move we award the downtown traffic study contract to OHM advisors in the amount of sixteen thousand six forty. Second. Second. <laughs> that was easy to say. <laughs> well, Gora. Hi. Johnson. Yes. Nielsen. Yes. Noah. Yes. Sexton. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Rich. We're going to stay up here for a couple more. <coughs> Take it. Uh, capital Improvement Plan Phase 1. On February 28th, the city received an open bid for the 2017 Capital Improvements Plan Phase 1. 
This project includes replacement of water and sewer and street infrastructure on 11th Avenue between Park Street and Washington Avenue and Campbell Street between 5th Avenue and Ripley Boulevard. Bid documents were sent to various firms and plan rooms with two bids received as listed. Elmer Screen and Dozer out of Hillman. Um, and I'm going to read the as tabulated. There was a 50 cent error in, in one of the bids. Uh, $1,074,645.10. MacArthur Construction out of Lachine, $984,334. Funding has been established in the water and sewer funds for 11th Avenue and Campbell Street. The as bid prices are below the funding available for each project in the water and sewer budget. It's my recommendation to City Engineer that the project be awarded to MacArthur Construction for the bid unit prices totaling $984,334. $984, and again, I apologize, I have a really cool graphic that I was going to have put up tonight. But basically, between what we already have out to bid, which we bid last fall, um, and Jerry McCarthy's going to be doing that, which is second and third um, from Washington uh, West in the City Hall parking lot. This project, and then we're going to have a, um, we've got a resurfacing project up for bid right now. If everything holds true, we'll, we'll have about $2.2 million worth of work under contract for the summer. So it's, it's going to be a, a, a good year for more construction in the city. Depending on how you look at it. So <laughs> that's that's, that's how you're going to spend that. Well, huh? Just don't say Sobble Street. Okay. <laughs> it's been a long time since you've been able to say that as yes. well. So. Uh, MacArthur Construction, uh, is that the main contractor we've used in the past? We've used them around town here and such. Okay. They, they, they've done probably 80% okay. of our work the last several years. I move we approve the bid for MacArthur Construction uh, for the amount of 984334 for water, sewer, and street reconstruction. Second. Out of the dead tie. <laughs> Johnson? Yes. Nielsen? Yes. Nowak? Yes. Sexton? Yes. Wallagora? Aye. And your last item is the city concrete project. On February 28th, the City of Alpena received an open bid for the annual City Concrete Program. Bid documents were sent to various firms as well as posted on the City website with three bids received per the attached bid results. Bedrock Contracting, $38,364.25. Zan Brothers Construction, $56,142.50. And Ryan Brothers Incorporated, $58,665. After reviewing the proposed prices, it is my recommendation to City Engineer that we award the City Concrete Program to Bedrock Contracting for the 2017 construction season at the unit prices outlined on the attached bid tabulation. The contract has an option for a one-year one renewal. Um, and we, this would probably be done as two separate motions. Um, that portion, if you would like to award it, and then also the resident cost for sidewalk replacement under this program is established at 60% of the cost for installation of four-inch replacement sidewalk. This cost would include both the contractor cost of $3.20 and the engineering cost of $0.35 cents per square foot, totaling $3.55. 60% of this cost would be $2.13. It is my recommendation as city engineer that the property owner sidewalk rate be established at $2.13 per square foot. This would be an increase of $0.07 cents per square foot over what we charged them last year. Didn't last year the price go down or it was the same, right? It was the same. Okay, so is this really, in two years it's went up $0.07. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Any so we award the City Concrete Program to Bedrock Contracting for the 2017 season. Second. Gotcha. <laughs> Nielsen? Yes. Nowak? Yes. Sexton? Yes. Walgora? Aye. Johnson? Yes. 
just one, one other quick thing. And I think I sent this to all the council members, but uh, to try to, to hit off some of the concerns with our citizens during construction, uh, Shane and our office went through and developed a, basically a property owner's guide for city construction projects. It kind of outlines what they can expect, um, you know, kind of our process as we go through the project, um, some safety issues that we'd like to heat, and then stay connected. Um, basically, here's all our contact information. We also, we also send them a letter um, that says, if you would email us with your email address, just put CIP in the, in the header, We'll add you to our email distribution list, and then we can keep you do updates email-wise. We've had about a dozen or so people sign up for that on, on the first few projects we've done. But it's our intention to mail this to every every property owner along with that letter, and then see, the more people we get on that email list, the more updates we can provide to them. It's worked pretty well for the Second Avenue Bridge. We've got a, a limited email list for that that we send updates as they become available to it. And, but at least, you know, this way they can hang on to it, they've got all their contact information. So just another tool to try to help them do these projects. Now you send those to every resident or every resident affected by the construction? Every resident, not, what we do is when we, when we build our projects or design our projects, we get a mailing list for every property owner that's affected, okay. even on the corner. I mean, you know, they may not, their address may not be right there, but we're touching their property. Sure. And so we set, we, we take that mailing list and then send a mailing out to them. And then in that letter, mm -hmm. along with this, we would ask them if they, you know, if they email us, we can put them on a, on a distribution list so that we can update them. Very good. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. And we have the sidewalk. I move that. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. I move the property owner sidewalk rate be established at two dollars and thirteen cents for the 2017 season. Second. Nowak. Yes. Sexton. Yes. Wolagora. Aye. Johnson. Yes. Nielsen. Yes. Okay. And next up, communications and petitions, Michigan Arts and Culture Northeast or MACNI annual report and budget request. I don't see Tim here. Thing here. I wonder if he thinks that was the meetings at seven. Maybe so. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, a thorough report. I'll read this yeah. thirty-page yeah, report. Yeah, no, we did make sure we told him six o'clock. Um, no, no. I, I think at this point we'll just it'll be included in our budget discussion and then presented to council. Okay. okay. And I think we're all aware of what the project yeah. is. Mm -hmm. Back me. It's not their first time here. Um, Yeah, so if we have any questions, maybe we can just bring um, Tim in for our next meeting. I'm sure he'd be happy to talk about that. I'm sure he would. All right, so is that a receiving file or just that's just an item of one I have? Sometimes we do. Sometimes we do, don't we? Yeah, I know we do. So you know, let's, let's receive a file. Go ahead. Someone. Receive a file. Okay. <laughs> we so. do have a pretty thorough letter, though. Yeah. Yes. So can you act upon a letter? No, well, no we don't act it's on it now anyway. You won't be kidding. Yeah, yeah, it's just a request that goes oh, into okay. everything else. Did you do the motion? <coughs> Nielsen did the second? Or? Oh. Yeah. I will. So. That's good. Yeah, that works. Thank you. Whichever way has my gosh. Who's on first? I know. It's <laughs> like our first meeting. Sexton? Yes. Wallagora? Aye. Right. Johnson? Yes. Nielsen? Yes. Snowak? Yes. All right, thank you. Uh, no unfinished business. We have some new business. Council policy statement number 25, use of exercise equipment at the public safety facility. Matt and I already talked about some of the times today. You should have a new copy. There was a couple errors in there. Um, there was a much that should have been lost um, as well as um, family members should be signed in, and it actually is family members must sign in. We want a more accurate picture of who's signing in. But the first thing I'm going to do is just tell you a little bit of, you know, why we're doing this. Obviously, back in 1996, things were much different. And we haven't actually looked at this since that time. And back then, the public safety director actually was in that building on a regular basis, talking with the guys, using the facility himself. And so 
it's just a different it's different times now so we needed to take a better look at it as well as address the entire staff so um, that's part of the puzzle in the last year we have had three incidents in the workout facility and two of them were things that we had to report to OSHA and they were also covered under our work comp policy and what we're trying to do is try to bring down our injuries and uh, have less go to our work comp carrier Meadowbrook and they asked us will you please look at your policy because we had one very serious injury that was concerning he's fine but you know it was serious at the time we were very concerned so they asked us if we'd take a look at this that was actually just about a year ago and it's taken us this long to sit down and talk about it and then of course we had several other things pop up but anyway this policy just gives us um, I guess a little bit more handle on what's going on who's coming in and out what equipment they are going to be using the family members that are using it to be sure that they're actually in there with a family member because that is part of the policy um, it also does require the firefighters because they're the only ones that can actually work out while on duty to bring a slip in from their physician indicating that they are physically able to use that equipment to full capacity um, if they are not we will have a line on the certification that the doctor does need to write on there what their limitations are so that you know they know too that maybe it's a progression maybe they start off lifting 100 pounds maybe they work up to you know wherever they want to be but it's just it, it also makes them go to a doctor which of course is something our wellness team wants to happen um, there is one item on here this to bring to your attention and that's under special conditions for fire personnel and it's a we currently do not have a position filled that is an eight-hour position it's still in the union contract that it could come up in the future but if it does get filled in the future we probably would sit down and talk to that person again because none of our other eight-hour employees actually can have that afforded to them DPW the police or even the administrative staff so that's something we would look at again but we left it in there because it's currently in the contract but we'll have to look at that again at that point in time um, skimming over this fast because like I said I talked to somebody about this a little bit but I just want to show you when we knew that we really had to do something we had them, had them starting to sign in which was a requirement in the past but just to show this is everybody that's working out signing in our employees on and off duty and I think that shows that the room is really getting used and that's what we want to see happen we want to see it get used but we want everybody to be very comfortable and safe in that facility so I think that what we've done is allowing that to happen and um, they have three months essentially three months from April 1st to have the doctor certification so it's not like hey tomorrow you have to have that done because we know in the city of Alpena it's not always easy to get into a position because we're shorthanded um, but I will have the certifications done by the end of the week so really they'll have over three months to be able to get into a doctor or get a certification done for uh, them to put on file they'll have to have it done annually just in case there are any changes in their health and I will monitor the employees that have those on on file do you have any questions about this again I went quick because you had it but is, is it typical that an injury during a workout session falls under workman's comp it does because they're on the clock so we if even if they are you know working at their own pace if they are working on duty it is a work comp we cannot exclude them from the claim Okay, so it's just that we can't do it. We no, can't do it. Okay. We cannot do it. And actually, that was brought up. I had some employees request that. They said, hey, I'll, I'll you know, punch out or I'll do whatever. But they have to be on call. Therefore, they have to stay on the clock. So in that bylaw, we cannot allow that to happen. Is there any way that we can protect ourselves if there's just gross negligence? Like if I wing a barbell at somebody and him in the head, well, I mean, is, or we are always going to be responsible for a well, workplace. Well, that, of course, is going to go into our harassment and discrimination <laughs> policy. And then, we, then we call across the hall to the police <laughs> to come in and investigate. That yeah. is a mistake. And we'll call Eric, and he'll take care of it for us. But um, 
you know, we've well, not had any problems at all. But again, it's an old policy, and where Comp asked us to please take a look at it. Yeah, we we have, you know, with it with a having to have the certificate, the, the issue of free weights. You know, we're we put a limitation on there unless the doctor says otherwise that you have to have at least a spotter. So somebody isn't in there lifting, you know, 300 pounds. I don't even know if there's 300 pounds there, but if there were, and they're alone, and it slips, and nobody comes in for a while, and they're, you know, crushed or trapped under that. So, you know, we're trying to do what we can on the things that could be most dangerous. And actually, um, Brett and I <clears throat> talked about this just today, and when they're going to go in and they're going to lift the free weights, and they're something that's probably a little heavier, they always have a spotter in there. Rarely does anybody go in there alone. They go in there with somebody and they work together on their lifting. Well, you would think fire and police are going to be safety conscious. They are. <laughs> they better be. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Nothing else? Okay. Thank, you. Thank you, Kathy. <clears throat> Can make that active. I move we approve the amended council policy statement number 25 as presented. Second. Holder. Aye. Johnson. Yes. Nielsen. Yes. Noah. Yes. Sexton. Yes. All right. Next up, waterways grant request. Dan Gilman is here. I know this is a little short notice, but Greg assured me he did it on the other land. Please respect it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, thanks for adding it to the agenda. <coughs> but through the efforts working with the Michigan Ports Collaborative, of which I'm the Vice Chairman, we're in the process of applying for a grant from the Michigan DNR Waterways Parks and Rec Division. The purpose of the grant is to fund an economic impact study that includes tourism in relation to recreational harbors and accessible waterfronts. The end product will be a fillable form, such as Excel, that will show the economic impact on a community due to the waterfront activity. Local communities would be able to plug in their own numbers to help come up with a result that's community specific. The amount of the grant being applied for is $42,280 and requires a 50% local match or $21,140. Included in the grant are fees from Bill Boyd, who's a retired DNR Waterways employee, who's going to write, administer, and file the grant. And the balance will be used to pay Dr. Vince McNini for developing the study in the form. I just looked up a little bit. I've spoken with them on the phone through the board from the Ports Collaborative. And um, he he has a PhD in international business and marketing from Old Dominion, an MBA from a state university that got cut off, a Bachelor of Science in Hospital and Tourism Management from Virginia Tech, recently ranked as one of the top 12 most prolific hospitality researchers worldwide, has published six books and more than 150 articles and reports. And he's been featured numerous times on All Things Considered and other uh, NPR programs. That's just a little bit of who he is. <coughs> now, in order to be eligible to apply for the grant, the MPC needs a community to allow it to be applied for in their name. I'm the last board member with any official ties to a local government. And that is why I'm asking you to authorize the application in, in the city of Alpena's name. The MPC has enough money to pay for the grant application process through Bill Boyd, so even if the attempt at the grant is unsuccessful, the MPC will pay uh, Bill's upfront money. As this grant will be a benefit to any Michigan community with the harbor, water, or waterfront, my plan is to reach out across Michigan with the help of Michigan Port Collaborative and the Alpena Area, Area Chamber of Commerce. I've already spoken with Jackie Krawchak about doing this, and she's, she's agreed to help. I've also been in contact with former elected officials, harbor masters, and CDP directors throughout the state, and all have expressed interest in participating in the study. I expect the city of Alpena will contribute $1,000 towards the match and the balance to come from other participating communities. If for some reason the match cannot be reached, we just let the grant fight. So. <coughs> I'm therefore requesting City Council pass a motion to allow the MPC through its agents to apply for a waterways DNR grant for the aforementioned region in the amount of $42,280. And if you need any questions on this, I use words like form, 
it'll be a program that goes on your computer. It'll last a few years, and then there, it may require periodic updating, but that will be handled through the Michigan Ports Collaborative at the time that we get this thing up and running. And if you're not familiar with the Ports Collaborative, um, it started about 10 years ago. So I got stuck on it as, as soon as uh, Eric Klein was the position of assistant city manager was, was done. So they were them with the other group I belong to, the Great Lakes Small Harbors Coalition, were why we were able to get $567,000 to dredge our harbors with no match. And when normally that would have been a 25 to 50% match. So the groups, the, the porch flavor is dying on the bar. There's five of us there. <clears throat> and they talked about getting rid of it. But this is a perfect project to bring the porch collaborative back in the light and get communities talking to each other again about our harbors, which again resulted in the grant for dredging, you know, because pressure was brought to bear and uh, uh, local elected officials, uh, state officials, federal officials, we hammered on all of them and worked out pretty well. Don, just to clarify, this is a 50 50 match, right? Correct. So it is not a grant of 42,000. The total project's 42. The grant would be 40, 21, whatever, and some change in the same with the match. Yeah. So the total project would be 42. And I assume you're kind of guessing that our contribution would be 1,000 bucks. Well, that's that's going to be dependent on partners. I right? figure I'm taking that out of the Harbor Fund. You know, and that's what I told them I would put in. And, I'm, and I'm, we're going to look at other communities that would put in 1,000 or 500. But thinking about how you know, you can shape this to your community. I mean, it's, for me, it's kind of a no-brainer. Who would spend five hundred or thousand dollars to have a study done that actually does something other than tell you that this is going to happen if you spend more money? That you can plug in numbers that you have. There'll be some background that all, in other communities will do for, for Dr. Vince. You know, give them things like the jobs because of the waterfront. What kind of jobs did you lose because of the decline of the waterfront? All that stuff's going to go into this template slash computer program that's going to be. It'll be like an Excel spreadsheet or something. Because I specifically asked them, we're not just going to get a document that says, yeah, you know, in Michigan, this is what it looks like. Because I'm not interested in that. I can buy those all, all day long. No, this is going to be specific to the kind of numbers and information that you're allowed to feed into it. So I just see it. It's very, it'll be very beneficial. Okay. I like it. I hope you find 20 other but communities. But on the off wall chance, it goes over $1,000. <laughs> I mean, if we if we get to the point, it comes where out of his pay then. Yeah. <laughs> Someone <laughs> yeah. forced me to take a second job. He's laughing. Yeah, he was laughing. He's laughing. Right. But I mean, if it gets to the point where I'm anticipating there won't be any issues, but if it gets down to where maybe it's three or four thousand, you know, I work with the other communities that are interested prior to committing and using it. Maybe we do want to spend more. I mean, it just depends how the product starts to look. Like. But anything above that, obviously, will come back right. to you as a council. Sounds great. Thanks, Don. Any other Do questions? Do you need something from us? Yes. Know. Yeah. We, we, since we're going to be the applicant, right. which means we're going to be the fiduciary on this, uh, right. we're going to need council to authorize the submittal of the application under the city's uh, name. And I'll put it, it'll be put in the harbor budget. I assume there's a deadline on this, which is probably right. Yeah. Well, April 1st. But oh. I just did that wait until the point of the council meeting and forget about it again. Very good. And will we allow the MPC through its agents to apply for a waterways DNR grant for the aforementioned reasons in the amount of 42280 Second. Johnson? Yes. Nielsen? Yes. Nowak? Yes. Sexton? Yes. Polagora? Okay. Before you adjourn, I was remiss and I should have done this at the beginning of the meeting if you'll give me just a minute. I'm going to adjourn. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> Leslie Doyd is here, who's the director of the uh, DDA. Her last day is uh, this Friday. Uh, she's been on the job, what, five years, roughly? Uh, I was putting a lot of time and effort uh, on behalf of our downtown, and I just wanted to say on behalf of the city staff, and I'm going to say it on behalf of the council as well, that thank you for all your efforts and wish you the best of luck in your new job with uh, Friends Together. Thank you, Greg.
Thanks for thinking of that. <laughs> yeah, we can. I move we adjourn. Second. You are watching All About Alpino. All About Alpina is produced by Alpina Marketplace Productions.